1959, Marjorie Sharp's book, The Rescuers, was an absolutely roaring success and was followed up by a sequel called Miss Bianca in 1962. Now, 1962 was also the same year that Walt Disney ended up buying the rights to the book, and this is where he began developing a treatment the following year with Otto Englander, who originally had the story centred on a Norwegian poet unfairly imprisoned in a Siberia-like stronghold. Then the location ended up being shifted to being set in Cuba, as the mice would help the poet to escape to America. So obviously, of course, this is 1962-63, so this is the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, etc. However, Walt Disney ended up deciding that this story would be a little bit too political, so they decided to scrap that. So the film was shelved for many, many years, and it wasn't until 1968 that Englander again tried to revive the story, but this time having it set in medieval times with Richard the Lionheart. But again, this story ended up being scrapped. So finally, in 1971, you end up having Don Bluth. So we're going to do a video on him in the future. Uh, he was a very influential director. But at this time, he was still working with Disney Corporation. And this is where uh, he decided that it was going to be pushed forward. Because at this time, the Disney Studios wanted to make B pictures, right? So this is basically not like main uh, films, which they kind of had made like feature length films. Instead, this was going to be cheaper, low-budget films with just a very streamlined story. And so that kind of explains a lot when we kind of get into the rest of this film, but anyway. So with regard to this as well, they kept experimenting with different ideas. So for instance, there was the idea of, you know, uh, of a penguin holding a polar bear hostage. But again, they decided the Arctic is just too stark of a setting. And also, come on, let's be real. How can you have a penguin as a villain? It just doesn't really work. So in the end, Wolfgang Reifelman, who's the director of this, he had had enough and he decided, it's too complicated, I want a simple story. A little girl gets kidnapped and the mice try and get her back. Period. So I'm very glad that Reifelman just kind of put his foot down with this and as a result of this, the story ended up finally going somewhere. And with regard to a villain, uh, they decided that uh, they were going to get inspiration from uh, the Duchess uh, in the story of Miss Bianca. And so they decided that the setting for it was going to be in the Louisiana bayous. So that covers the uh, story of the creative process that went into the making of the film. But now we have to start talking about the story of the studio. So with regard to Madame Medusa, uh, she was actually originally modelled off of Cruella de Vil. However, Reifman said, no, we do not want just another Cruella de Vil. We want her to be her own character, and so we don't want her copy and paste. So as a result of this, you can see from this that while she has many of the same mannerisms as her, she actually was a, a lot fatter, but also a lot more uh, lower class. And also you have this story as well, which is I just find absolutely hilarious. So Mr. Snoops, he is actually based off of a journalist called John Colhane. Now, he was a journalist who used to interview uh, the Disney animator team. So they obviously must have taken a dislike into him. And so they decided that Mr. Snoops was going to have the same mannerisms and the same look as this John Colhane guy, right? So I find that absolutely hilarious that they basically took such a dislike to this guy that they decided to just rip on him throughout the course of this film. So now that we've covered that part of the story, now we have to talk about the casting. So Eva Gabor, uh, she is the voice of Miss Bianca in this but she's also the voice of the Duchess in Aristocast. So I highly recommend that you watch our video with regard to that so that you find out more information with regard to Eva Gabor. Next, you have Bob Newhart, who is the voice of Bernard in this. But if you've ever seen the film Elf, he is actually the person who plays Papa Elf within that. So I highly recommend that you go and watch that video and then, you know, look out for him. Although it should be noted that he wasn't in any other um, notable films. Next, you have Geraldine Page who is the voice of Madame Medusa in this. Now, she wasn't in anything too notable. The only notable one I can think of is uh, Hondo, which is a John Wayne film from 1953. But other than that, she wasn't in anything too notable. Next, you have Joe Flynn, who is the voice of Mr. Snoops. And he appeared as himself in Sesame Street, which was a film which came out in 1971. So this is like Elmo and all the rest of it. But what's interesting with regard to him is that he did the voiceover for this film in 1974, but the film obviously came out in 1977, but he actually died in 1974. So he died three years before the actual release of this film. So just a little bit of trivia with regard to that. Next on screen, you can see a whole list of different minor characters within this. 
they weren't in anything noticeable, so that's not really worth going on about. The only honourable mentions that we have is Pat Buttram and George Lindsay. So Pat Buttram plays the muskrat in this, and George Lindsay plays the rabbit. But they are the voice of the two dogs within the Aristocats, and also they appear in Robin Hood. So definitely go and check those two videos out uh, for more information in regard to them. And then also you have John Feidler, who is the owl in this, but as we covered in the last video, he is the voice of Piglet. And then finally, you have James McDonald. Now, he is the sound effects guy for the dragonfly in this, but also, as you can see on screen now, he did sound effects for many other Disney films as well, so absolute legend. So with that, we have to end the section where we talk about the cast. So on top of that, within the, uh, the story of the studio, we also have to mention the music. So this was the very first film for a long, long time where the Sherman brothers did not do the music for it. So actually the music here was done by Carol Connors and by Ian Robbins, and nearly all the songs were sung by Shelby Flint, who also appears as one of the minor characters within this. And it's also quite notable that this is the only Disney film where the characters don't actually sing themselves. Instead, like, there's like singing in the background, so we the audience hear it, but none of the characters obviously hear it. And then finally, we also have to talk about uh, xerography. So as we've mentioned in previous videos, ever since uh, the days of 101 Dalmatians, Disney Studios used xerography. However, by the time of this film coming out, the technology had improved. So whereas before, the lines on the characters were very, very sharp and very harsh, now they were able to soften it slightly, which made it a little bit more lifelike. So that's just something to kind of mention in regard to that. So that kind of covers the uh, story of the studio. And now we have to talk about the themes and the history of it. So this film here is obviously in 1977. And at this time, it's obviously like the very beginning bit is set in New York. And New York by this time had really changed. So if you look at Taxi Driver from 1976, you can see that New York is a very dark and very grimy place. And actually this shows a big, big change kind of like because this was the huge crime wave that you had in the 60s and the 1970s so whereas if this film in new york had been set in the 50s or even in the early 60s it would have had a completely different feel but by this time here new york was seen as a very seedy place a very crime ridden place and so that was why it was the perfect setting for this kind of very dark story and also as well something really notable is the fact of is you know the actual storyline itself and that's because it's about kidnapping, which is obviously very, very dark. But around this time, this is where you started to have the rise of people basically becoming helicopter parents. Now, what is helicopter parenting? This is where you're having parents who are scared that their children will be kidnapped. And therefore, rather than whereas before they would just allow them to like roam free and play with their friends outside. Now you will start to see more and more the shift of the society away from children being free and just playing about by themselves to more of a thing where, you know, the children have to be kept at home and the children spend less and less time with their friends and more and more time with their parents. So as you can see on the screen, uh, this is where you see a huge dip off from where it was in the 70s and the period before it to what it is in the present day. So this period here kind of represents the beginning of that shift. And actually, I have to say that this film did not help that at all because it's playing up to the thing of, you know, people getting kidnapped, right? And also, I would say that the messaging within it is really, really terrible. But there's an element to which it focuses on child abuse. So one line that's really notable is where Madame Medusa says this. Adopted. What makes you think anyone would want a homely little girl like you? So within this, you can see how basically she's manipulating Penny and basically, you know, really crushing her soul. But it's quite a dark film. And what I would say is that parents watching this at the time would have, you know, made been even more scared about letting their kids go out. So actually, I think that this film actually facilitated much of the problem. There's no kind of like positive hope. There's no kind of, you know, it's a thing where the message I think is quite terrible. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's a thing where you know, the message is your child is going to be kidnapped and they're not able to kind of figure things out themselves. They're quite naive. They're quite stupid. So the only way they're going to get out of the situation is if mice help them. Yeah, great messaging, right? But anyway, so that talks about the kind of like themes in the history. And for some reason, 
for some reason, in terms of the legacy, which we're, we're talking about now, it had a very positive legacy. And I really don't understand why. Because if we look at the...